Memory deduplication is widely applied to reduce memory consumption. Today we are going to see three attack techniques that exploit memory deduplication. We have two incredible security researchers here with us today that will show us how this attack works. And to the left I have um, Antonio Baresi, and to my right is Eric Bassmann, Bossmann, sorry. And uh, they will then use the chance to also um, introduce themselves. Please help me welcome Antonio and Eric. So, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. <laughs> This is memory deduplication, a curse that keeps on giving. So unfortunately, it's uh, just Eric and me, so Ben and Kave uh, couldn't make it. Uh, but they say hi, and uh, I just want to say that uh, the credit goes also to them. So we prepared the talk together, and a big part of the content comes from them. So Eric, uh, as he was introduced, he is a PhD student uh, at the FUSEC, uh, Networks and System Security Research Group. Uh, in Amsterdam, so if you want to see what they do, go to the website, fusec.net. And I'm Antonio, I'm co-founder of ExorLab, a Swiss IT security company uh, in Zurich. So the work that we're going to present, actually um, there were a lot of other people working on that, and here are some acknowledgements. Uh, yeah, so let's start. So the message today is actually quite simple and straightforward. Memory deduplication is much more dangerous than you might possibly think in the beginning. So it comes along like a nice little feature that uh, helps you save memory, but uh, we're going to show you that it's actually dangerous and much more severe. And we're going to do that by uh, showing you three attack techniques that all exploit me memory deduplication one or another way. Before we do that, we'll look at memory deduplication so everyone knows what it is. Uh, we're going to show you the side channel that gets introduced by it. And then we start with the three attacks. So first we have Kane. Uh, Kane is a cross VM leak attack, which basically allows you to leak base addresses or other secrets with higher entropy uh, from other VMs. And we applied it to ASLR because we thought it's an interesting case. And it only relies on memory deduplication. We'll then show you DDoP as Machina. Uh, this is an attack against a process uh, and actually got the Pony Award at uh, this year's Black Hat for most innovative research. And it relies on memory deduplication and row hammer. And basically it allows you to uh, read and write uh, through JavaScript in, in Edge without any software vulnerability. And then we're going to present Flip Feng Shui. Flip Feng Shui is a cross VM uh, bit flip attack. So basically, um, Imagine you could flip a bit in another VM, and the only requirement is uh, you, you have to know the content of the page, of any page. So how would you actually compromise that system? So we're going to show you, um, so first of all, how you can bit flip precisely, and then we're going to show you two techniques to actually compromise the system with that bit flip. After that, we will conclude. So let's start with uh, memory deduplication. So memory deduplication is a method to reduce memory consumption, and it's usually used in a virtualized environment, but not exclusively. And it was also enabled, and I, the emphasis is on was, uh, in Windows 8.1 and 10. So the idea is that uh, in virtualized environments, for example, uh, uh, the virtual machine module will try to uh, be quite a resource um, um, or uh, try to save memory. So basically, we'll overcommit certain resources like memory, and memory deduplication is a technique to reclaim certain pages in a clever way. Or, uh, the, or easily uh, speaking, uh, run more VMs. So basically, it's a nice feature, right? Uh, the idea is you can, <laughs> you can just have more VMs on the same hardware, but you'll see that it has certain implications. So let's look at how it, look, uh, it works. So basically, uh, this is an example. You see memory pages of two virtual machines and the physical memory of, of the hardware. So let's say you have like uh, the picture of the Mona Lisa or a same process running, so the same code pages. 
or something else, some data. So basically, uh, in a normal scenario, you'll have uh, both address spaces uh, filled up with these pages and all consume one physical page. So when memory deduplication is enabled, um, the memory deduplication implementation will try to identify these uh, duplicates and then it will merge them so that the blue space uh, gets free again. And it will mark these pages as, uh, with a copy on write semantics, which basically means if someone writes to it, it, it uh, has to do something else, uh, it's not going to work. Now, uh, one implementation is kernel same page merging uh, with K KVM. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that. So uh, if you have a Ubuntu server or Ubuntu system, usually that's, I think, even now enabled by default. And you can check it. So there is like uh, the run file under the sys file system where you see if there is a one there, it's enabled. And then there are certain parameters that allow you to uh, define how fast the memory deduplication should work. And there are other implementations as well. Um, so the problem with memory deduplication on most implementations is that uh, it doesn't respect the security domain. And so basically, even between two different VMs or if it's done for processes, if you have two different processes, you cannot trust each other. But it still works <laughs> across these boundaries. And uh, uh, actually, that's the dilemma of memory deduplication de 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 because uh, in the end, you want to save memory. And it makes a lot of sense, right, if you have a lot of VMs running the same operating system. So uh, it makes sense to cross these boundaries. But the problem is it introduces a side channel. So let's look at the side channel. So if you have a page that uh, belo belongs to you, you'll just write to it, and that's it. Okay. So the problem is if you have memory duplication, you have copy on write. So now if you write to it, you need to go to the kernel. Uh, the page has to be duplicated again. Uh, test up the page tables, and then uh, resume the process again. And then you basically can write to that page. So you see that there are a lot of more steps involved here. And this introduces a one-bit side channel that allows you to see, basically, if such a page exists in another process or in another VM. Uh, it works cross VM if it's implemented in the virtual machine monitor, cross process, or as we will see, uh, we will see one instance of that attack, even within a process, you have different security boundaries. Uh, think about your JavaScript code, right? So it's, it might be interesting for your JavaScript code in a browser to find out certain things. So let's look at the attacker perspective now. So what does an attacker have to do to exploit that? Uh, so basically here, the attacker has his memory. This might be a VM or a process. And then there is the victim. So there is a secret page that basically knowing that that page exists might help the attacker in one or another way. So what the attacker has to do is it, the attacker has to guess a page. So in that case, he really has to guess the content of that page. The attacker has to wait a certain amount of time, write to it, so modify his copy of the page. So this is totally legitimate. You don't need more privileges, right? Measure the time and then see if the write time is above a certain threshold. The attacker can deduce that uh, this, that page existed in the other VM, for example. And if uh, the write time is below a, th a certain threshold, uh, the attacker may, uh, can deduce that didn't exist there. OK. So let's look at the first um, attack, Kane. So Kane is cross-VM address space layout introspection. I actually regret already the long name <laughs> every time I have to say it. Uh, and basically only relies on deduplication. And the idea is to use that to uh, break ASLR. So basically you have a VM uh, that runs next to you, memory deduplication is enabled, and you will be able to find out what the base address, for example, of NTDLL is in the other VM. So let's recap what you have to do as an attacker. So first, you need a secret page that allows you to deduce interesting inf information. And in our case, it's the ASLR base address of a certain DLL, for example. So the question here is, what page should we use? Uh, then, of course, there are so certain practical challenges. So how long should you actually wait? Uh, for Because you'd have no idea how fast the memory deduplication scheme is. And then, in the end, you have to uh, practically detect that it was merged. So you can measure uh, write time, but you'll see that, uh, in practice, there, are, there is also noise involved. So sometimes write time is higher, and it's not because of memory deduplication. So <clears throat> we looked at uh, suitable pages to break ASLR. Um, and I mean, certain uh, straightforward criteria are you have to know as an attacker that that page exists in another VM. 
Uh, it has to be read only ideally in the VM because if it changes too often, then it will not be deduplicated. And uh, uh, it has to be page aligned, so, so you really need to know the content, mostly of that page. Uh, and then if you want to break ASLR, you need ideally a page that has a base address in there. So basically the green part is totally uh, predictable for an attacker. Uh, and the only thing that the attacker doesn't know is uh, the base address. Or another uh, possible page would be a page that actually uh, has different values that were uh, derived from a base address, so from the secret that you're interested in. <coughs> and the other thing you have to know is also the offsets. Uh, of these secrets within the page. So we were looking uh, for certain pages and we are sure there are much more, uh, but luckily uh, when we were looking at the first page of every executable PE image in memory, you'll already had a, have a hit. So if you look at the PE file format, uh, it looks like on the left uh, for uh, an image on disk. So there is an image base field there, which basically gets updated with the runtime base address in memory. And this is exactly what we need. We can predict the inter all other bytes except for the base address which has uh, 19 bits of entropy. <coughs> and there are, of course, other pages that fulfill that criteria. But we, we thought, I mean, why, uh, why, why should we look further if you already have, uh, have one? So we use that page in the POC then. So now the problem is you have this page. Uh, you can basically ask that memory deduplication side channel uh, if if that exists or not, but the problem is you still have to guess the base address, so you have 19 bits of entropy. So 19 bits of entropy uh, in uh, x64 uh, windows uh, is used for uh, the base address of uh, DLL, for example. So as you need one page per uh, guess, it's more than 500,000 page pages that you will need, right? So if you will do that after each other, basically it will take you a lot of time. Uh, but of course, uh, we can just brute force it, right? So we can use much more memory, all the memory that the attacker actually has, right? So the attacker has much more memory, you can assume that. Usually you have maybe, if, uh, you have a different VM, two, four, or even more gigabytes. So we can just fill up the entire memory that is, is at our disposal with all the guesses. And in case of 19 bits of entropy and one page per guess, it's two gigabytes, which actually is, is, is okay. <clears throat> so what you do is you have these pages uh, and then you allocate them and then you try to detect it and it's a classical brute force attack on this that uh, memory deduplication side channel. So the other challenge that we had, the practical one, is uh, how long should we wait? Of course we could just wait like hours, right, and at some point uh, would work. Uh, but it depends, so we want it to be a bit better. So in the end it depends on the memory deduplication implementation, so how fast is it? So you've seen so, uh, so the parameters for KSM, so depending on the parameters it might be faster or, or, or uh, slower. But it also depends on the memory usage, so if you have a lot of VMs running, in the end you have to compare all the pages to each other. So you have to go through all the pages and if you assume the worst case, then your guest page will be compared with the secret page uh, at the latest point in time. So there is a trade-off for the attacker. So if the attacker waits too little, then the attack will just not work, but if the attacker uh, waits too long, then the attack time increases, and that's also not favorable for, for the attacker. So what we came up with is a, a detection mechanism to detect this memory deduplication, um, basically uh, the time you'll have to wait till you have certain guarantees that your page was compared with another one. We call it sleep time detection. And the idea is, uh, as an attacker, you can just allocate a lot of uh, random bytes and a lot of pages. And then you copy every second page uh, of, of the half of your buffer to the other half of the buffer. So what you create is basically the situation, like on the slide, where you have a lot of merging opportunities. <coughs> So you basically uh, give the memory deduplication scheme a lot of uh, work. You, you create a lot of pages that can be deduplicated. And then you wait a certain amount of time, like 10 minutes, try to detect how many of these pages were merged by doing your detection magic. And then if the threshold is above, uh, detection is above a certain threshold, you say that's the right time, so you use it in your attacks. And if not, you just increase T and then you try again. So last practical challenge is how do you actually detect that the page was merged and uh, what you have to do is, I mean, you have to write to it and you have to measure the uh, write time, right? So what we did is we, every time we have a guest page, so that's the orange one, the merged uh, one, we have 
pages, adjacent pages uh, that are for sure not merged. And we know that because we can just fill it up with random bytes, okay? So you create uh, the buffer in, in, in such a way, and then you just write to it and you measure the cycles. And then you'll basically see uh, this signal. Now, of course, there might be noise, so we developed certain heuristics. Uh, we didn't invest that much time to do that, but the ones you see there work pretty well, and that was fine for us. Works for me. <laughs> so, now, the last uh, question is how to handle noise, right? So we just implemented it in a quite conservative way because there is actually no harm if, if you uh, have certain uh, pages that uh, or certain false positives. So what we did is we implemented a rounds based system where uh, you try to detect it, then you uh, do it again with the guesses that might be potentially um, correct, uh, and you do it over and over again. And in the end, uh, as the noise will not affect the same guess uh, all the time, you, uh, it will work, but it might take certain rounds. So um, I'll show you some results for uh, a Windows attack. So we implemented it to attack, uh, to um, basically leak the NTDLL base address of a neighboring Windows 64-bit uh, system. So if you look at the entropy, you see basically for data, it's quite high. So that approach wouldn't work that easily, um, at, at least not if you have no control uh, over how this uh, the secret is, is aligned. So basically, uh, for DLLs, we have 19 bits of entropy. And if you have the base address of one anti DLL, you basically can use it in your exploits for all the other processes, because it's usually not re-randomized. Uh, re, uh, so uh, we did it with the standard KVM, uh, KSM configuration with uh, sleep millisex 200, that's default. And basically, you see when we attack one single VM, it took us a bit less than five hours uh, to basically do that. And we had like uh, some rounds till we reduce the entropy from 19 bits to, to the actual uh, base address. And we all also wanted to show that it works with multiple v uh, VMs. So we speeded up the memory duplication by having sleep millisex 20. Uh, and there you see, even if you have more uh, victim VMs, it works. It just takes more time because uh, the sleep time detection will tell you to wait more <coughs> because you have more memory uh, that is used. So in the end, uh, how it looks like, so we, we have a video demo, but we don't have that much time, so I'll just show you the screenshot. We have a demo for, a for another attack later. Um, basically, um, here you have the attacker VM, and on the right you have the uh, victim VM, and you do your magic, you, you, uh, you allocate uh, these pages, you measure write times, and so on, and in the end, um, you just have the base address of the, uh, the anti-DLL in the other VM. That's it. So the attack is... Uh, rather slow, I would say, but there were a lot of speed improvements that we didn't uh, actually follow up with. Uh, but one way would be to have more random pages in between so that the noise will not affect your guess uh, or the probability is lower that that happens. And the other thing is you can also use more than one guess page, right? So have redundancy already. Because you might have, for example, code, relocated code pages that all have that secret. So you can just use many of them, right? The only thing is you cannot use the same page because if you have it two times with the same guess, uh, then you create this merging opportunity and you have a false positive. So you need different pages that all have the same uh, uncertainty or the same secret. Now, Kane is, I would say, a cool attack, but the problem is it's still quite limited. So one problem is we don't have any control over the victim memory, right? So we, we really have to rely on how these pages are, uh, um, what the layout of these pages uh, are, and uh, also how, where the secret actually is. And we need to find these pages. So there is no control, but some control would actually help a lot. So we didn't really investigate at how we can do that cross VM. And then, of course, it's a leak, right? So you still need a vulnerability uh, to exploit the base address, for example, the secret that you got, if that's not enough. But last year, uh, I mean, there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of talks and a lot of uh, publications about Rowhammer. Uh, even here at, uh, uh, at the Congress, Clementine and uh, Daniel presented uh, Rowhammer JS. So basically, they show that it's possible in JavaScript. So let's say uh, we, we, are opt we were optimistic that uh, we could do more. And then Microsoft basically enabled memory deduplication, or we uh, noticed for Windows 8.1 and 10. Uh, cross-process, uh, but it's disabled again, so it's not enabled anymore. But let's say it would have been cool, but it didn't go that well. <laughs> so 
So for the next attack, uh, we call data est machina. Uh, we, we try to take it a step further. Um, so in this attack, we're going to uh, uh, combine uh, deduplication as a side channel attack with Rowhammer in order to exploit uh, Microsoft Edge, uh, Microsoft's new browser uh, from JavaScript uh, without making use of any software bugs. Or, well, if you consider, uh, if you don't consider deduplication a software bug. <laughs> um, so we're going to leak two secrets, um, and we're going to use deduplication to do this. Uh, the first secret is uh, uh, a, heap, uh, a heap pointer. Um, it's a location to data we control. And the second uh, secret is a code pointer, and that's, uh, yeah, needed. Uh, and those two secrets are needed to uh, together uh, create a fake object uh, in our uh, memory. <coughs> Uh, but then we have a problem because, uh, and this fake object will allow us to do arbitrary reads and arbitrary writes in memory. But we have a problem, JavaScript of course doesn't allow us to create references to this fake object, it's just in data. So we will use Rowhammer to flip a bit in a pointer and point uh, this pointer to uh, our fake object and then we are basically, uh, we can take over the process. So. Uh, in, this, in contrast to Kane, uh, in this attack, uh, we won't only be using, uh, be probing for existing pages in memory. Uh, we will uh, assume that we can uh, uh, manipulate uh, the data of the, uh, the victim uh, uh, in some way. Um, and this is not really unlikely. If you think about it, every time you do I.O. to something you uh, want to attack, then you're manipul manipulating memory in this uh, process, and in this case, it's from JavaScript, so uh, it's even more easy. Um, and this allows us to not only probe for, for secrets that just happen to be in pages that we can leak, uh, but we can craft memory pages that just contain the secrets that we want to leak. So it's quite a bit more powerful. Uh, but still, uh, there are some problems with this. Uh, uh, the secret that we want to leak might not be uh, somewhere. Uh, the secret we want to leak was, is probably somewhere in a page which contains other information that we don't know, and then we cannot craft a page to leak the secret. So we need to find a way to uh, kind of encode the secret into a memory page uh, such that, that we uh, can retrieve the secret again. So. Uh, so, so the secret, uh, the, the memory page that we want to leak sh should contain only the secret and data known to us. Um, so uh, this could be that uh, because this data was uh, written by us into the address space of the victim, or it's just data that we know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, data that we know uh, the contents of in some way. Uh, and there's a Second problem, we might want to leak a secret which has too much entropy, uh, so much entropy that we <coughs> cannot possibly uh, brute force the whole, uh, all the possible secrets. Uh, and for this, we have uh, found some ways to get around this uh, and uh, leak secrets iteratively. Um, the first uh, uh, method we, uh, we tried was, uh, uh, we call alignment probing in this, uh, in this case, uh, we manipulate the uh, victim into creating a memory page uh, or putting the secret somewhere across memory uh, page boundaries. In this way, we can, uh, uh, in this way we, can only, uh, in, we can partially leak the secret in one, uh, in one uh, round and then uh, when we, yeah, and then uh, the, we have to get the victim to uh, create a memory page with the secret, sli uh, slightly more of the secret in one page, and so on and so on, and we'll, we uh, leak the whole secret. Uh, the second primitive we uh, uh, tried was uh, we call partial reuse, where we assume that the, uh, the, yeah, the victim has a secret somewhere, and then we write data uh, for example, in, in a buffer that 
was previously used to store the secret, and then we write data <coughs> in, the, in this buffer um, and overwrite only part of the secret, and then again, uh, the entropy, uh, again, such that the entropy is low enough to, uh, to leak it. Uh, and uh, the, the first of these two primitive uh, the alignment probing uh, is what we're going to use uh, to leak the code address in this case. Um, and we're going to make use of uh, Microsoft Edge's uh, JIT uh, uh, compiler. So every modern browser has a JIT compiler compiling uh, JavaScript to native code. And, uh, for every chunk that's translated uh, in Microsoft Edge, uh, the, the function epilogue, so the last part of the translated code, is always looks the same, except for one thing, namely a code address. So, uh, and what we did was uh, create lots of uh, JavaScript functions, which are just uh, uh, just too big to fit into one memory page, such that the code address. Uh, uh, spans multiple pages, and then uh, well, normally the code address is, is 19 bits, so it would need, we would, would need two gigabytes of memory. In this case, we need only uh, 16, I believe. Um, uh, and yeah, so um, so so we in this way we can in one sweep we can leak. Uh, leak part of the address, and then the second sweep, we can leak the complete <coughs> uh, value. So now we have a code pointer, um, but we still need to leak a heap pointer, and there's a problem with this. Uh, we didn't find uh, a situation where we could leak the heap pointer directly uh, using the two primitives before, and uh, the heap pointer has quite a lot of entropy. So. This is uh, an example of a heap pointer in uh, Microsoft Edge. Uh, there is some advertised randomness on Windows 10, uh, 24 bits of randomness. And if we only look at that part, uh, we'd need uh, 64 gigabytes of memory just to try every, one, every, uh, every possibility. And then we need to multiply this by a bit uh, to get redundancy, because there is noise. Um, but if we look at uh, uh, how a pointer actually looks like, there's also some kind of lots of non-determinism, which uh, actually inc increases the the entropy of the pointer by quite a bit. And yeah, we don't have hundreds of terabytes of memory to probe, so we needed uh, to find something else. Uh, we could improve this a bit. Um, that, that we found another side channel. So if you allocate lots of arrays then um, every one megabyte, um, uh, the browser will ask the operating system for an extra megabyte of memory. And then the first uh, object that fits into the new allocated uh, uh, one megabyte, uh, it will take longer to allocate. And that's something you can detect. Uh, so then uh, we have a timing side channel. And then we can reduce entropy to uh, 20 bits. But we'd only already yeah, need uh, at least four gigabytes of memory, so that's also not uh, nearly good enough. Um, so we had to find something else. Well, luckily we found something else, um, something uh, very much like uh, yeah, it, uh, uh, yeah, the intuition is very much like uh, that of the birthday problem, which. Uh, uh, in, in which you, uh, in a very, um, in a surprisingly small uh, group of people, the chances of uh, two people sharing the same birthday uh, is actually uh, becomes pretty high, uh, uh, more than more than you would naively think, uh, faster than you would think na <coughs> naively, and the intuition behind this is that you're not uh, comparing one person's birthday with a group of other people. With other people, you're actually comparing everybody's birthday with everybody else's birthday. And when you think about uh, it, this is exactly what memory the memory deduplication routine do does as well. It compares every page with every other page. So um, how can we exploit this in practice? Well, we're going to assume that we don't have one secret to leak, uh, but 
uh, lots of secrets, and then we have lots of uh, guesses, and then there's a yeah. You co compare every guess with every secret, and then you get uh, yeah. We you need way less memory. So um, uh, so in practice, the victim has secrets, uh, and then you kind of need as uh, you don't need as many different uh, guesses to actually get a match. So uh, how do we exploit this in practice? Well, we have the this uh, we allocate lots of objects, and then we get a due to the other side channel we get a. <coughs> uh, uh, um, a list of objects which have are probably on one on a megabyte boundary, and then we allocate a large array, which of course is in practice just memory pages, and then we put a reference to or a pointer to each object in this array. So, and then there's one uh, pointer per memory page. So these memory pages kind of encode the addresses of the of the objects, and those pages are, we're going to probe for. And then on the other end, we're using a typed array, which allows us to completely control the bi uh, binary contents of memory. And then uh, we're uh, going to uh, create references to uh, objects which are 128 megabytes apart, and then recreate the contents uh, of the uh, <coughs> Of the the pages that uh, um, the contents of the uh, how they would look like if they were in the array. So uh, so uh, you can see the the secret pages are close together and one megabyte apart, and then the pro pages range uh, range across the entire address the possible address space uh, that that uh, edge might possibly use. And then in the middle there's a hit, and then we get our heap address uh, belonging to a uh, belonging to a, an object where we control the data. So now we uh, uh, have the, all the information to create a fake object. Uh, now we're going to use Rowhammer to create a reference to this object to uh, allow us to use it. So the object is a typed array. The fake object that we make, which allows us to basically control, uh, yeah, read and write the entire address space. Um, so this typed array, uh, this this uh, typed array object, this fake object, we recreate in a JavaScript array that we know the address of, and then um, uh, the next JavaScript array has a pointer to it, and then. Uh, we recreate it in such a way that if we flip a bit, the pointer will uh, point to our object in instead of the array. And for this, uh, we're going to use the row hammer attack. Uh, uh, yes, like uh, Antonio said uh, last year, uh, some of you might have seen the row hammer JS talk. Um, we re uh, we were able to reproduce. Uh, uh, their findings and uh, uh, on Windows 10, uh, and use it uh, to our, uh, yeah for an attack. Um, in the ROM attack, uh, the problem is that uh, TDR memory uh, uses uh, capacitors, uh, capacitors to store uh, memory uh, store data, and when you have to when you read it, the capacitors are drained. So. Um, yeah, these capacitors are stored in rows, and then because they are drained, there has to be some kind of cache which doesn't lose its value, so which is a, a static RAM uh, buffer. Uh, but it's only a limited amount of memory, so when uh, the memory controller reads, needs to read a different row, the data has to be written back to these capacitors, and a different row uh, is read to the, uh, the buffer cache. Uh, the problem is that this uh, creates some interference, and if you do this in quick uh, succession uh, at, uh, at specific locations, then uh, um, and uh, uh, then after a while, some bits may flip in neighboring rows, and that's uh, 
what we used to flip a bit in a, a pointer, allowing us to uh, get a reference to this object, uh, and basically taking control of over the process. So that's the second attack. Uh, in the third attack, uh, we're, uh, we call what we call flip feng shui. Uh, we actually are also using raw hammer in combination with deduplication, but in a different way. Uh, we won't be using deduplication as a software side channel anymore, uh, but we will be using it uh, to make raw hammer more uh, a more useful uh, uh, exploitation primitive. Uh, and, and our target will be uh, 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 one. Of, uh, yeah, so on our in our uh, attack, an attacker will uh, be in control of one virtual machine and will uh, take over another virtual machine on the same system. Uh, so, like I said, the um, uh, Rohammer is a yeah Rohammer is a very powerful. Uh, attack, but uh, it's it's also quite difficult to exploit because uh, you can corrupt bits, but it's not really you don't really control which physical bits in memory are vulnerable to it. And if you can flip bits, uh, yeah, you have to uh, the, the the data that's um, the data that's uh, being corrupted has to be useful to you. So you have yeah you you, you kind of have a problem. Of getting the right data into the right location for you to exploit, <coughs> so it's unpredictable in, in which physical page the flip will happen, and it's unpredictable on, in which location in this page um, it might happen. Uh, a flip feng shui uh, can solve the first part for you. So, uh, <coughs> given that you can flip a bit in some page. On the same, in some location in the page, a flip feng shui will give you the ability to get a, an arbitrary page you know the victim has and put it in the location where you can flip the bit. Uh, another thing to mention is that with Rawhammer, if you discover you can flip a bit somewhere, it's very likely you can flip it again and again and again and again. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so, so we're going to uh, uh, look for uh, pages that we want to uh, in the victim that we want to flip, and then uh, make sure that these pages are uh, put into a, a location where we can flip these bits. So we thought uh, memory deduplication is a kind of a, a an attractive uh, way of doing this. Uh, we thought. Um, uh, and we're, we're working on the Windows 10 attack, and we thought, well, what if we, yeah, so if we do row hammer, find the bit flip, <coughs> what if uh, if we find a page that we where we want to flip a bit, we just replicate the, the same content of this page and then wait for Windows um, to merge them and then hope our our locate uh, our page would be the the location. It would merge to, but sadly enough, on Windows, Windows allocates a new page and, uh, and points the, the old uh, old locations to the new location. However, uh, we found that on uh, Linux with uh, kernel page merging, it didn't. So, and it had some other um, uh, it had had some other uh, things that are advantageous to us. Uh, for example. Uh, Linux uh, tries to give uh, consecutive uh, physical memory to uh, uh, to virtual machine hosts for efficiency's sake, so uh, which makes it makes it uh, easier for us to do row hammer and find bit flips, and also makes it easier for us to uh, make sure that the, these bit flips occur in our own memory and not in someone else's memory. Which uh, yeah we w wouldn't want to corrupt uh, a system before we can exploit it of course uh, crash the system before we can exploit it <coughs> so uh, so once we know we can flip a bit that's useful to us uh, we replicate the the content and then wait for KSM to uh, merge memory and 
uh, we can know in a, dis uh, in a deterministic way whether our KSM will merge it to our page. And then we do ROM again, and then we can uh, exploit the target victim. <clears throat> so one example how we did this was uh, by attacking the authorized keys file. Authorized keys files usually contain uh, public <coughs> keys, uh, and these public keys uh, are not supposed to, uh, uh, yeah, they don't have to be kept secret. Uh, I bet lots of you have probably uploaded their public key to GitHub, and they're public. So, um, um, and what we see here is uh, in yellow we see the so this is an RSA public key, and in ye yellow we see the RSA modulus uh, base 64 encoded. <laughs> Um, of course, we cannot, we're not supposed to factorize this modulus because then we can get the private key. But uh, in red here, uh, we have uh, a, um, a, a characters which contain at least one bit that, when flipped, will remain base64 encoded, but we're able to factorize uh, the modulus uh, uh, within one minute. So uh, that's uh, what we did. Um, flip a bit in the, uh, in the modulus, factorize it, and then reconstruct the private key and log in. <laughs> uh, we have a second example where um, where we target GPG uh, and apt-get uh, to exploit the up update mechanism in Debian or Ubuntu. Um, so uh, and it's, this is a two-stage attack where we first correct uh, the, the sources.list file to uh, redirect uh, the update uh, repository to a domain name we control. Um, um, <coughs> And uh, we also corrupt uh, a bit in the GPG key ring to corrupt the signing key to a key that we can reconstruct. Um, and then we can backdoor, uh, uh, <coughs> and then we can backdoor um, uh, packages uh, being installed. So we have a demo for this as well. So first, so this attack, uh, uh, so what you see here is uh, is a machine running both an attacker virtual machine and a victim virtual machine. Um, in the uh, uh, top right corner, there's the the victim. Well, in a minute. Uh, so top left, there's some debug information. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the bottom part is the, the access log of, of a HTTP uh, uh, update repository server that we control. And the middle part uh, is, is used to create a, a <coughs> fake uh, create a fake package. So now nothing happened yet, and uh, apt get uh, update is run. So this is all fine. But now we're going to flip a bit in the sources.list file. And then when we uh, do up, uh, get update again, um, there will be an error because now it will connect to uh, our repository. Of course, uh, uh, this step doesn't have to be uh, 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 done, but it's just to show that yeah, the, the, that it now connects to the first uh, to our repository. Well, then we have, have to wait for a while to find a bit um, that we can exploit to corrupt uh, the GPG key. And when we have done this, um, we can uh, reconstruct a, a private key and create a new package with the new signing key. Great. 
launching a new package. And then when the uh, uh, when upget upgrade is run, oh, first we do ls, it's still uh, okay. But then after the update, uh, our code is run. So. So, in conclusion, I think, um, um, <laughs> yeah, I hope that we hope to have convinced you that memory deduplication can be dangerous. Uh, if you're thinking about uh, employ, uh, uh, deploying it, think, uh, we'd like you to think again and think again and think again, and then maybe conclude, well, maybe let's just disable it. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. If you do have questions, please come forward to one of those four microphones. Does the internet have a question? Uh, none. No question right now? OK. We have a question on the microphone on my left side in the front, please. Yeah. And please speak loudly into the microphone so we can hear you yeah. while people are leaving. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, how does this apply for large pages? So I think in all your examples, you had small pages for eight kilobyte. So how does this apply to two megabyte pages, for example? Yeah, so um, uh, kernel same page merging uh, uh, employs large pages, but uh, actually sadly, well, good for us, but sadly uh, um, the uh, kernel same page merging um, prioritizes merging over huge pages. So uh, actually we create huge pages at the start and to do the row hammer part. That's the consecutive memory uh, thing. But when kernel same page merging um, finds a, a page which is identical inside this huge page, it will break up the huge page and merge anyway. So okay. that's actually the b worst, worst uh, case scenario. Okay, I see, thank you. Great, thank you. Then the next question would be right behind you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, about uh, the process of deduplication itself. Does it use hashes or other things to actually speed up the comparing? Or some hardware acceleration maybe even? Or uh, what's just the cache and the timing, uh, the uh, imp uh, uh, impact of uh, that process running on the background? Yeah, so we didn't do uh, research on, on the latency but I think it does use some form of hashing both on Linux and Windows. Yes, and the next question, please. And while, before you ask the question, could I please ask the audience to remain quiet at this point? Thank you. So these attacks, um, they, they uh, require that I, if I'm a, the attacker, um, own or at least have interactive access to a virtual machine hosted on, on the same uh, um, host as the um, target machines, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, th what are the implications for a, uh, say, v VM or whatever uh, environment um, thinking of um, desktop virtualization where actually uh, the virtual guests are uh, being used for interactive access and so you run uh, JavaScript in a browser or whatever because I'm <laughs> like every week uh, being approached by companies trying to sell us uh, desktop virtualization. So the idea of, of uh, running that uh, gives a complete new um, uh, large open door for, for um, malware spreading across um, virtual client computers, right? If they are, if there is desktop virtualization. So, so uh, our second attack, that it, as Machina, was uh, done on Windows 10. So there we could leak information uh, because Windows 10 uh, does uh, memory deduplication uh, not only for well, not for virtual machines, but also for its own processes. So, uh, and Windows has disabled it. But if you uh, run Windows on a hypervisor where deduplication is yet again enabled, then yeah, you have the same problem again. Thank you. And then I have a question here on the right, please. 
<coughs> Do you also have the problem if you uh, so? But, uh, are you vulnerable if you have both ECC memory and, and exempt any cryptographic secrets from um, deduplication? Um, so I haven't seen a practical attack with ECC memory on Rowhammer. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, um, and I, I guess if you if you have cryptographic secrets and you don't deduplicate it or you put some randomness in there that is impossible to guess, then I'd say there's not much you can uh, leak from that point on. But it's something, I think it's uh, not, not, yeah, you shouldn't burden an application developer to uh, be aware that their memory, pay, even to be even be aware of the content layout of, of their program. That's pro most of the time very much low level stuff that yeah, application developers have no, uh, shouldn't have to have any concept about. So, I think this is really uh, up to the, the, the operating system and hypervisor vendors to, yeah, not use basically. <laughs> Thank you. And in the back, please. So when you merge the pages, you can have more of. You can have two in those examples. You can have more of them. How do you know which page will be the one that will be the last one um, get so, so like um, you merge into it because it would be good that it's the one you control so you can flip the bits and how do you know yeah. if you have like five VMs and every one every has the same page so so it's it's kind of uh, complicated so the um, um, so in K SM it's the oldest VM that gets merged to but there's an exemption if you first merge two pages and they are put in uh, the, the first, so it first merges to already merged pages and then it merges to the oldest VM. Um, and so the, so the attack becomes harder if you're the second VM yeah, being so started. To flip things, you need to be the first one, so then they will merge into you. Well, not necessarily, but the attack becomes a bit harder because um, so what you could do is if, uh, so, so uh, the merging happens because uh, files are in the page cache. So if you can, uh, if the files are not yet in the page cache in the victim, because uh, no one has tried to log in for a user for a long time, um, you might be able to first create two pages in your own address space, wait for it to be deduplicated, then log into SSH. <coughs> And, and then uh, SSH will load it in the page cache, and then it gets merged to your page. And you win because you're merged already. And okay, thanks. Thank you. And a question here in the front, please. Uh, yeah. So if it, if I understand it correctly, um, the attack works uh, only if you know uh, if you detect the time difference uh, between when a copy on write happens and when it does not. Uh, wouldn't it be able to have implementations of deduplication with some artificial timing edits, so there's no real difference? So, um, well, the, the copy and write takes time, so there's, um, yeah, there's probably not, uh, no, yeah, so there's always going to be a time difference because you don't want to have artificially, you don't want to artificially slow every write operation, that's just... But uh, would it be theoretically be possible to do it? <laughs> if sure. timing is not a yeah, constraint. But then you have to, uh, all the write operations, you have to slow them down as well, right? I mean, this is not feasible in the end, so. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There is a question from the internet. Uh, yes. Uh, the question is, can this be applied uh, for long PGP keys? Can we leak them? Uh, so leaking the the complete contents or breaking them or uh, doesn't say so in the question. <laughs> I suppose it's about leaking them from memory. Um, if you can find a way to, for example, first load them. In so, so it really depends. So that we. Uh, it, it takes some effort to find the situation. So you have lots of uh, lots of uh, uh, opportunity to 
find, find situations where you can leak data, but it's really difficult. Uh, yeah, it, t it just takes time to find, right, uh, find right, the right circumstances because it's just so much you can explore. So it's so we didn't uh, uh, find uh, so we didn't look for uh, um, a situation where we could leak GPG keys. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's uh, uh, impossible. I do think that some that, that uh, some crypto uh, applications really make uh, try to uh, not keep. Uh, private keys in memory longer than needed. So uh, I wouldn't know. Maybe you can try and uh, find out. All right, thank you. Great. And then we have a last question over here, please. Maybe do you have some advice for the Linux kernel programmers? I think in the second um, example, you said, for example, the page D application used, I think it was Windows 10 was better. They did first copy the page to be deduplicated in a free page and then pointed the two pages to be deduplicated there and in Ubuntu it was that they just point one page to the other and drop, drop the page. So the Microsoft approach is here more safe. Yeah, I'd say so. I, d I don't know if they were aware of this but uh, in this case, well maybe they were, I don't know. Uh, in this case, it was, and, and there are certainly some approaches are, uh, uh, are make it harder, and some approaches make it easier. Uh, of course, the, the relocation doesn't prevent us from leaking data, but it do, would help. Uh, uh, yeah, would help uh, maybe with with uh, making Rohama harder. Although we also have a, uh, our group also has a paper on. Ro, uh, ro, uh, on Rohammer uh, on Android, where we don't make use of memory deduplication, but with a, we make use of a different uh, mechanism in order to control lo uh, where memory pages uh, are uh, get uh, relocated. So, yeah, from Rohammer we can't do anything because we have to. We would have to change the memory architecture. But maybe you can uh, publish some ad advices. What what to do better with, for example, memory deduplication? What you found you, you for in your researches, just as an idea. Yeah. So so there are some uh, mitigations. Uh, uh, we don't know if yeah. So my but they always have a, have some a performance penalty drawbacks and so. I, I don't know whether they will be implemented because, uh, or, or uh, standards, uh, yeah, enabled. Uh, so, I don't know. <laughs> okay, Bye thank you. Memory. I'm thank sorry you. we have to cut it. Thank you so much. Um, so please help me um, thank Antonio and Erik for a wonderful demonstration. <laughs>